I'm going to say I'm not a public speaker. This is not a very comfortable place for me, but I absolutely love gardening, and I have learned how to start a few seeds over the last few years. So um, I'm going to start first with saying if you do have any questions, please ask them. That actually makes me feel pretty comfortable up here then. Um, so I'm going to start with first off, what is a seed? A seed consists of three different parts. There's the seed coat, which is our hard outer layer, and then there's the embryo, which is the tiny plant that's in there already, and it holds all of the DNA of what the plant is going to be. And then there's the seed leaves, which are called the cotyledons, and they have all of the nutrients for the plants until the true leaves come. So your seed leaves, the first leaves that you see come out, are actually not an indication of the plant because they all look quite similar. So, but once the cotyledons um, have done all of their work and used up all of their fertilizer that they have right in them, then you get the true leaves and then those are the ones that you can tell what kind, a little bit more of what kind of plants you have and expect your cotyledons to fall off. I know a lot of people get nervous because they're like, oh, the first leaves are turning yellow and dying. That's actually good. They're actually, they're done their job, they're not needed anymore. So, um, all right, next I am going to go into the different types of seeds because that can be pretty confusing for people. And I didn't bring any up here, but there's um, treated seeds and a lot of seeds that are treated ones, they'll have some kind of a fungicide on them so that they don't rot in the ground. And like I've got some corn seed back there and it's got like a red cover on it and that is a fungicide so that they don't rot in the ground before they are supposed to germinate. But a lot of garden seeds themselves are not treated. And then another one is pelleted and they are like a carrot seed. If you plant carrots, they're very hard to get them planted far enough apart. So then they, then they have treated seeds so that they're big enough that it's, you are actually able to plant one seed at a time. And then there's some that are multi-pelleted seeds that they'll actually have a few seeds in each pellet so that it, and then it just helps you to spread them out a little bit better. Um, and then there's seed tapes, which is a tape that's got, um, it's like a paper tape with seed proper distance apart so you can just roll out the seed tape, but you can also make your own seed tape with toilet paper and putting your own seeds on and then you've got your seed tape a lot cheaper than what you buy and you've got it for, um, then you can get them ready when otherwise you wouldn't be working in the garden. So, um, also there is open pollinated seeds and pollinate those ones are naturally pollinated without any medical intervention so that you just leave them outside and they get the pollen from other stuff um, the benefit with open pollinated ones is that it's a lot easier for you to save but some things like squash seeds and pumpkins you don't want to necessarily save the seeds from those because they could have pollinated with another with another kind of squash and the one year I saved seeds and it ended up being a cross of a squash and a giant pumpkin so I had these giant things with nothing beneficial inside them because what was supposed to be spaghetti squash was quite frankly not. So that is your open pollinated and then there is heirloom and heirloom are one that has been consistent in the type of plant that it produces for, um, generally they aim for about three decades, so about 30 years before it can be considered an heirloom. Um, so then they just, yeah, they hold on to their, to what they are. And then there's the confusing ones. Some people get hybrid and GMO messed up. And a, a GMO is genetically modified organism. So a lot of GMO plants can have even a little bit of non-plant-based genetics injected into them, but they're, according to the Fine Gardening website, there's actually no garden seeds that you can buy that are genetically modified. There's some commercial, um, there's some commercial seeds, especially in tomatoes and, and potatoes is what I've kind of understood, that tomatoes that you can buy 
like if, if you're a commercial grower, you can buy genetically modified, but in our garden seeds, when they say non-GMO seeds, that's actually a sales tactic, because all of them are non-GMO. And then a hybrid, some people get nervous, oh, well, I don't wanna buy a hybrid. Well, a hybrid is actually just cross-pollinated of this um, lettuce variety and this, what, so what are some of them? Right, there's one that's like a Brussels sprout cross-pollinated with kale. Then it's become a hybrid because you've got collets instead. So then, um, and then you can also do hybrids within something like in your tomatoes. Like there's some hybrids and then they are bringing in genetics of a tomato plant that produces earlier, but then they like the, the part of, um, of, the one, of the other tomato because it's big and pasty. So then, the, then hybrid is very different than GMO. I just want everyone to recognize that. Um, and then there's also sprouting seeds, and a lot. And um, you can try buying sprouting seeds because they are like people think, oh well, they're, the sprouting seeds are quite a bit cheaper. So why don't I buy a thing of broccoli sprouting seeds and use those to grow them to um, into broccoli plants? But a lot of them won't. They are, those seeds, I'm not sure exactly what they do with them, but they are just for sprouting. You're not gonna quickly get a nice, beautiful head of broccoli off of those ones. So, um, all right. There's a broccoli cauliflower mix? Yep, nice. there is, is it's broccoli flower, yeah. Do they start that by a seed? That is a hybrid also. So it's mixing the two, because usually those genetics, like a broccoli and cauliflower, they're not going to cross with each other. So that's why they do it in a lab, and then you got broccoli flower, and I've heard it tastes really good. So, um, and then we also have annual seeds, and an annual means that, that the full life cycle is completed in one year, so it goes from starting as a seed to producing seeds all in one year, so like a tomato, and a pepper, beans, those are all annuals because you can harvest seeds the same year that you start them. Whereas biennials require two years in order to complete their life cycle to go to seeds. So something like um, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, beets, carrots, all of those are biennials because you need to, they need to survive till the following year. They need to go through that cooler snap in order to to produce seeds. And sometimes they will produce seeds in the same year, but most of the time they're not viable seeds then. So, and then perennials is that the top foliage is gonna draw, die back during the cold season each year, and they'll then regrow from the root system. So that's more like your, what would we say? Like, flowers. yeah, there's a lot of flowers, but like for, pardon? Asparagus. Asparagus is, yep, and then strawberries, strawberries, strawberries raspberries. Rosemary and sage and all these herbs. Yeah, a bunch of the herbs are too, that's right. The rosemary and sage, she said, so. But yeah, so there's a bunch of different perennials, but by far the most of, like, unless you're gonna be starting seeds, biennial and annual doesn't really. Or unless you're gonna be saving seeds, whether it's biennial or annual, it doesn't really matter to you. So, um, and then we, Jen kind of touched on a little bit of how to choose your seeds. Christy, do you want to go to the seeds or to the plants per foot? And so I know that people were asking Jen, like, how do you, how much do you plant for your family? Oh, I'm going to do that. Look at this thing. Um, and then this one kind of gives a really good idea of how much you need for average per person. So I've never actually paid attention to whether it's true, but it sounds good. So, um, and then again, just like Jen said, do not plant things that you're not going to necessarily like, or at least not much. So one year, I, a couple years ago, I decided I wanted to try out a bunch of different kinds of greens and different varieties of tomatoes and even peppers and stuff. And I grew over 300 varieties of stuff in the garden and just to kind of pick it out, but my husband told me I'm not allowed to do that again. 
because it caused me a lot of stress. So luckily I've kind of figured a few things out and it is fun, like with gardening, you've got to be ready to, to do some trial and error because if you're going to give up after something that didn't, that really didn't work, maybe you shouldn't do that. Try to, try to push on because like starting seeds, I started trying probably 10 years ago and every year after it. Like every year at the end, I was like, oh, I'm never doing this again. It went so awful. But I've tried it um, a number of times since, and now we've kind of got it figured out. It's going pretty good. Um, and then as for where to get seeds, there is lots of different um, seed companies you can order online. But there's also places like Algen Feeds that they have OSC and, a and another variety of seeds, and you can just buy them from, from there, and that's a lot of times easier than ordering seeds in, because then you can actually see the seed packets, have an idea of how much is in them. Um, what else was I gonna say about that? Ah, I don't know. Um, and then the other thing is to make sure, like Jen said, that you have enough time from when you start it, because even doing succession planting, like, Jen tried some stuff out, and I've tried some stuff out. We definitely have our fails. Broccoli doesn't necessarily do well when we start at the beginning of September. So, but it's all worth trying, and you'll figure out some pretty fun things that do actually work. Um, next is direct sowing versus indoor sowing. Don't buy started carrots from a garden center. Anything that's a root, carrots, beets, parsnips, a lot of those things, they are, they do not transplant well. Like you're a lot better to direct sow all of those, especially like carrots and beets and parsnips, they can handle cooler temperatures. So you can even start sowing a lot of those quite early out in the garden. And then something like beans, you don't, they are best not transplanted. Even a lot of cucumbers and squash, they, you can transplant them, but they get they get really bad transplant shock. So then something like squash, I was saying to someone earlier that when I plant my squash out in the garden, if I want them out earlier to extend my growing season or to get them um, harvesting earlier, I just buy domes at the dollar store and put that over the plants because then you can start them out earlier and not have to deal with transplant shock because does it set you about two weeks back, do you think, Jen? Probably, yeah. Yeah, so, so then if you start a plant and transplant it out, it actually goes backwards about two weeks. So you're, there's a lot, of, a lot of benefits in growing and just direct sowing, things like that. And then indoor sowing, that's obviously the one started inside and we are going to talk about that shortly. But there's other ways of starting seeds. I don't know if anyone has heard of winter sowing. And in winter sowing, you take um, any kind of a clear container, like if you get your apples, apple juice jugs, you cut, the, cut them partly open. I did mean to bring them, I just didn't. And then you can cut them partway open, take the lid off, and you plant things like brassicas, which is like your cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, and leafy greens, like even pak choy and stuff like that sage, oregano, dill, mint, a lot of perennial flowers, Swiss chard, green onions, and parsley. Those are some of the, the ones that I have found, especially brassicas, do really well with winter sowing because you plant them into those containers and it's like their own little greenhouse. And then you, you actually plant them, a lot of people have planted them in November, and you just leave them, set them outside, and they'll get covered in snow, but the snow helps to water them. And then once the temperature, right? God's got this all figured out. Like he knows when to change the temperature and increase the light frequency so that things grow. And in winter sowing, you are using all of what God has done and none of the, our own lights. So then you just put them outside and once the temperature see, is pretty good and the seeds are ready, then they germinate on their own. And then they're already hardened off. You skip the process of hardening them off from being inside to outside. And then a lot of those are ready. Yeah? So like, is there like a time frame when you can still do this? You can still do it now, but they need a cold spell. 
So like you're not gonna do, you're not as quickly gonna do winter, winter sowing in March. I guess they don't really need a cold spell. It's more that, that um, it gives them the best bet to get started on time. But you can really start a lot of them anytime. Um, the ones that need cold stratification, and there's a bunch of flowers, especially that do those ones if you're going to winter sow those you have to do them in like november so that they have that cold spell that that um helps to break the dormancy of the seeds so but winter sowing like if you don't have grow lights at least you can get some stuff started outside i don't find your warm weather things like peppers and squash and cucumbers and tomatoes they don't do very well because they need a lot more of a head start than that in order to be producing well by August. Like your brassicas, or brassicas are the best for winter sowing. And then, then once you transplant them out, then, then they get more space and everything. So don't throw too many into a pot, too many seeds. Okay. Because people do them like in um, the big clear pot yep. bottles? Yep. Yep. People do it in pot bottles and in your milk jugs. So there's anything clear. Yes? So, so she's asking if when you've got your container, if you take the lid off. So and what I do is I take off the lid. You have the lid off for the whole, the whole time that they're outside. But then they have a cut around the middle of their around, except for like a couple inches. And then when it gets too hot, you can flip them all the way open. And then it's, they just have their own little greenhouse for that, for that period of time. And then, because they've, they're already hardened off, once, the, once you want to transplant them, then you can just go straight into the garden without any middle step. So, and there is um, PDF print-offs um, for winter sowing. I do have one at the back I can show you if you're interested. Um, and the, other, the next thing is sowing seeds in cold frames, because that's another way of direct seeding, but we can start them sooner, so like, something like spinach. I actually start my spring spinach, a lot of it in November. I'll plant it inside a cold frame in November and then it's like a massive winter sown area. Then once the light intensity increases, which it actually increases quite quickly in February. Like I have my lettuce and my greenhouses already growing in February. And then that does the same with the spinach. Then it'll, spinach likes cool temperatures for germinating. And then by having it in a cold frame, it germinates a lot earlier than it would have otherwise. And then you get amazing bunches of spinach off. Whereas if you plant spinach in like May, you might get a few leaves if you're lucky. Because it really does not like heat. But another thing I wanted to say about spinach, if you love the taste of spinach, um, there's a, uh, a vegetable called auric. And auric is, tastes very similar to spinach but it can handle warmer temperatures, so you can actually grow it through the majority of your year and harvest something that's like spinach and freezes like spinach and everything. So, so it's a pretty neat thing I've learned about. Um, and other things that I would sow in cold frames would be lettuce and then even some brassicas. I'll sow them as early as I can get into my cold frames. I'll sow them in the garden so that they can start germinating on their own. Um, so next we are on to requirements for sowing seeds indoors. And the one thing which I didn't even bring out, I need a grow light. So I've heard of a lot of people trying to start seeds in, your, in their windows and it really doesn't work that well. A lot of our windows now are have a UV protection on them and then you might think that it's nice and sunny and beautiful out, but your plants are getting absolutely none of it and they're gonna still stretch. And even if, thank you, and even if you do have, um, that there isn't a UV coating, the plants, even if it's a massive window, they still have to stretch for the light. So the one requirement that I say you need is a grow light. Like that, when I started using grow lights, I started actually growing plants that survived till when I wanted to plant them outside in May. So then, um, this is an actual grow light, but you can also just buy shop lights. Yep. Yeah. Lift it up. Lift up the grow light. 
it's very dirty. It came out of my basement. So, so that's an, this is an actual grow light, and that's one from Costco. And then it's got the blue and red spectrum to it, which I used to have it memorized. I think blue is for leaves and roots, and red is for flower. Perfect. Okay. Um, so yes, you, you need to have some kind of, uh, we call them grow lights, but you can even use a shop fixture and get um, bulbs that are over 4,500 Kelvin is what's recommended. Because then you don't have to have an expensive light. So I can see a couple pieces of it aren't working presently. But yeah, that's actually like a, a very blue and it's blue. Yeah. It's so very blue. Red, red. Wow. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and then when when I'm starting plants, because I don't grow a lot of things to the point of flower, then I usually will just have the blue on because I don't want them to attempt to flower. So I'll just leave the the blue light on for because it encourages your roots and your leaves. Um, but yes, yeah, so I was saying over, if you, yes, about the bulbs, like you can just buy, is it called cool light? The over 4,500. Yeah. So, because we always say you have to have over 4,500 Kelvin and you can buy like, honestly, we buy a lot of our stuff at Princess Auto and they have some pretty good shop lights that have like 45 up to 5500 Kelvin and you can use that as your grow light for starting your plants and for starting like even your brassicas and stuff. The only thing with those is if you want it to do any flowering and any adequate flowering, it doesn't have any of the red spectrum. It has all of the blue spectrum, but a lot of people just start their plants inside. You don't even need to worry about flowering. So, um, and then most seedlings, when once they're up, they require about 16 hours of the grow light on in a day. So, and I, and I say once they're up, but at the same time, a lot of plants, and I'm not exactly sure which ones don't, most plants need a little bit of light in order to germinate. So then you do have your grow lights on for a period, even when you're trying to germinate them. Is that right, Jen? Yeah, it's once you get into your flowers, your annual flowers, that you're going to want to start playing around with the lighting. Okay, so, yeah, so then most, most plants, pretty much everything needs 16 hours, but the one exception I find is onions. Onions, you don't want to give more than 12 hours of light because if you start stimulating them too soon with 16 hours of light, they think that they're supposed to finish off their growing cycle. So when you're starting onions inside, you should have the, the lights on for 12 hours so that they still think it is a short day, right? If you imagine onions being outside, they don't have 16 hours now, even though I would generally start my onion seeds now. So they start with 12 hours and then that actually increases the capacity of the onion to grow big. Like last year, I had some two pound onions. So it's, I, I find that the 12 hours is pretty important and onions is really the only one that, that I really throw under the 12 hour lights. Um, and then another thing that is pretty important, at least for myself, I use a timer because I don't remember to go down and turn on the lights all of the time. So I have a 12 hour, I have a timer set to go on for 12 hours where I'll grow all of my onions and then all of the rest of them are set to go on for 16 hours. And also being Dutch, we're quite cheap, so we have the grow lights go on at night when the hydro is cheaper for us. So then we will, we get it set that way. Um, another, yes Jen? Does that mess with the cycle once you put it outside? No, because by that point, like usually, it doesn't seem to do anything. I don't really know. I've never found any problems, so like you're talking about for the onions. Or any of the any of the plants. Nope. Nope. Doesn't seem to do anything. Um, the other thing with the amount of light time, plants also need a break. They also need the dark. So if you have your plants by a window and it is getting a little bit of light and then you have the light on for 12 hours at night, your plants actually get no break. And then that's actually not best for the plants. So you need to have that break. Like my, my grow setup is all in the basement and we don't have any windows there. 
So the only light that these plants get is when my grow lights are on. So, because if you've got it upstairs where, the, where they get some natural light, you'll want to have your grow lights on during the day also because otherwise they are going to stretch for the light from the windows. Yes? That light that I, oh, the one that Adam brought in, it's a two foot, so it would really do this. Like you can't, when you've got your grow lights on, if you have a lot of stuff on the periphery around it, most grow lights don't, don't help with that. And then your outside plants are still going to go after the, going to go after the light. What distance? About two inches. Yeah, the grow light. And then there's some, I don't remember, is it the metal halide ones that are quite hot that you have to keep further away, Jen? Yeah, so but most people don't buy that. If you buy LED lights, you want them about two inches from, so from the plant. So you've got to make sure you increase them as the plants grow, just to keep them growing. Um, so, timer. Oh, and another thing, if you are, just starting with plants uh, or with starting seeds, I really recommend the moisture tester because a lot of people will be like, oh, well, the plants look dry, but yet it's just the top of the soil that's dry. So then if you use the moisture tester, it'll tell you whether you actually have to water because like my, my grow set up in the basement, it's only about, probably about 15 degrees. So they don't dry out quite as quickly as you would as you would think, like you have to water them, but it's not like you have to water them even every day. I don't water mine every day. Yeah? Uh, how do you water them? Um, how do you water them? I, when they're really small, it has to be either from underneath, so then I always have a drip tray underneath, and then I water into there, or else you spray them. And so my husband actually bought me one of those pump sprayers, because going like this with a whole pile of plants is quite frustrating. So then, then spraying is the best at the beginning, also because it, it um, helps to jostle the plants around, which brings me on to my next thing. You need to have a fan on your plants. Oh. A lot of places don't actually comment on that, but I find when you have a fan on the plants, your plants get used to wind. So it, it helps to harden them off a lot better. So that's one reason, and then also because it helps to dry out the top of the soil. I know we had a question about reasons that plants die, and the biggest reason that plants inside die is from dampening off, which is a fungus that attacks the plant right at the base, and then it gets all thin, and it dies because it just because it, of because of the fungus. So you have to, if you have a plant or a fan on it, then it dries things out nicely, and it, hardens them off for the wind, so fans are super important. I leave mine also on the timer with the lights, just so that, because I don't know that it necessarily needs to run all of the time, but it's but I let mine run at least the time the lights are on, so. Yeah? How often do you have to water? How often do I have to water? Probably every other day. Okay. But when you're spritzing, then, then you're putting a lot less water on. So then you've got to watch it a bit. Yep. Uh, what um, kind of potting mix do you use? What kind of potting mix? Yes, I am getting into that, but um, ProMix and BT, or ProMix BX and Miracle Grow are your two top potting mixes. Um, a lot of people are have been fighting against Miracle Grow because they find that it's it seems to come with more pests problems, like with what is it called, fungus gnats and stuff like that in it. So a lot of people are going away from that, but I know I, I still sometimes use it and I don't have an issue. But the ProMix BX is, is generally what I would recommend to start with. And there's other ones like um, Pure, Pure Life Soil, I've used them too. It's just you want to have, it's actually a soilless potting mix. You don't want any soil when you're starting your seeds because the soil holds on to the water too much, which increases your chance of dampening off. You're better to let it dry and then water it again instead of keeping it wet all of the time. Do you use tap water with all the chemicals in it? Or? So, I'm on a well, but you can use tap water, but the one thing that 
um, that I learned from experience was don't use soft water, because soft water has different um, calcium and stuff in it, and then that will actually bind to the roots, and then your plant will either be stunted or it'll turn yellow or it's gonna completely die. So you use hard water is much better. Yeah? Yep, yep, you can do that, and I have heard of people doing that. You stick it in the oven on a tray, right? Yeah, yeah. and then what's the temperature that you do for that? 350 for 20 minutes. So to, to kill off fun, um, spores and stuff like that, 350 for 20 minutes, she said, and then, which most, most um, seed starting soils, I think, are supposed to be sterile, but that gives you that extra, no, that's right, a lot of times they're not. So that gives you that extra little help, I guess. So, um, yes? I was going to ask about a soil from your guys. Is it better to have untreated seeds or treated seeds? Um, like I was saying earlier, most garden seeds are untreated. The treated just helps to, to prevent fungal, like them dying of fungus and stuff and rotting. Um, so next thing that I would recommend for starting plants is you need a seed tray of some sort that's going to have no holes in it and then the domes and the domes are just unless you're really good at remembering to water a lot more often they help to keep, keep the moisture in and they also help, help to keep the heat in but then once they are germinated once you've got most of your stuff germinated do not use the covers anymore because that's when you need to start letting it dry out so you don't get the fungal problems. Um, and then also we use heat mats because, so in, at our previous house I had heated floors and I would just germinate all of my plants on the floors, but then now I don't have heated floors at our place so then, I've, then we've gotten heat mats. <coughs> So and there's two different ones. Jen has another one out there that does not, or that, that has a temperature control. This is just from Amazon, they're like $20 or something, and it does not have a temperature control, but Jen's right that if you have the temperature control, you can make sure that you're not going to burn any seeds. Because something like onions, I find if you put them on the heat mat, it's actually too hot for them. Yeah? Okay. Okay, so, so he was saying that he'll put a towel between the heat mat and the tray, and then it kind of reduces the, the heat that's coming at it, and then you can alter the temperature. That's a good idea. So, um, so yeah, and then heat mats are obviously not completely necessary. If your house is quite warm and stuff, you don't necessarily need that. I just grow in the basement, so I use the heat mats just to help germinate, especially my tomatoes and my peppers. Those are like the two big ones that I use that for. Um, and then pots. We can go into different kinds of pots. So you can either buy empty pots and put your own seed starting mix in, which I very highly recommend. Or you can buy things like these. I don't, are they called jiffy pots or peat pots? So, and then for these ones, you put the soil in and and then you can plant the whole thing in the ground. I do not recommend these. They mold very quickly. Same as egg cartons. A lot of people say, oh, well, I tried using egg cartons and my plants died. Well, they first off, they hold on to the, the moisture. And then once they're dry, it's really hard to get them to soak, to soak up water. So these, I do not recommend. Egg cartons, I do not recommend to use. You're better off, like these ones are decent. So these are the the little peak pucks, and then you soak these, and then they grow up to be about this big. And they're not too bad. I know you had really good luck with those last year. And then they're also ones that you can stick the whole thing into the ground, or sometimes people rip off the, um, the mesh from the outside so that the roots can, can come out, because some, some of them that have very fragile roots, they have a hard time breaking through the peat pellets. Um, and then the way that I start mine is I use different. Yes. Well, I just said I use eggshells. You use eggshells. Yeah. 
child, yes, because that is then calcium. Yeah, yeah, so that's another, that's another one. I've actually never tried that one, so. Um, and then for myself, I use different pots. I just get my friends and family to save all the ones that when they buy plants. And then I just, you use different ones like, well, I don't use these ones as much unless I run out of this size because I find this size is really good for starting, like I start all of my tomatoes. My peppers, if I need to, I'll use these. Um, brassicas, if I am starting them inside for the greenhouse, then I'll start them in these. And then from that, you often have to transplant up. So something like tomatoes, I will often pot up three times while, the, yeah, the one time and then two more times while I'm still inside. So I will go from this size to this size to this size because the plants get so massive. <coughs> And then also tomatoes is one of those ones that they get roots off of the whole stem. There's not many plants that actually do that. But yeah, they'll get roots off of the whole stem. So then if you plant them at the bottom, then and then here's where your stem is, then you have roots on that. And then once I get into here, I plant them that the top is here, and then this whole bottom is roots. So then for um, hardening off and for transplanting out, they have a lot more space that they can take water and fertilizer from. So those are plant pots that I use. These ones I highly recommend because they're nice and tall. You use less soil, but yet you can um, plant your tomato plants quite deep. And you can even find these on the side of the road. I know I was talking to someone and they said that, and she said her husband, whenever he sees pots on the side of the road on someone's dump day or whatever, they'll go and pick them up. I'm like, hey, that sounds familiar. <laughs> yes. to make sure that you sanitize things. And I do have one thing to say about that because I don't always sanitize my pots and wash them. Like a lot of people will actually take all of their pots, get all of the dirt out, and then dip them in bleach and you leave them in bleach for, I don't even remember how long we did it that one year, because the one year I did have dampening off. So then I did it at that point. And you just leave them in the bleach for like, it doesn't have to be very long and then rinse them all out. But if you've got about 400 pots, that really doesn't work very well. So I just, I usually I don't even sanitize them. I hardly even clean them out, so. Okay, so how long do you use grow lights? So how long do you use grow lights? As long as they are inside. Okay. The whole time that they're inside, they need grow lights on. Yeah. Um, so yes, um, different types of seed starting mix. Oh yes, and then with pots, make sure that you have holes. You can use yogurt containers, make sure you put a lot of holes in them because if your plants can't get rid of the extra moisture, you are going to be dealing with diseases and stuff also. Um, all right, next I have how long do seeds last? Um, most seeds last a lot longer than what you would expect. So onions is one of those things that onions, if, you're, if you don't plant all of your onion seeds this year, next year you won't have a very good um, germination rate. Onions, I don't keep my seeds longer than one year. I plant them all and I think last year we had like 400 seed of onions because I plant all of the seeds. <laughs> so, so onions, you can't like, I wouldn't keep them much longer than a year. Leek would kind of be in there too, but then a lot of other seeds can handle five to even 10 years. And I know that that is one that I tried to get the chart with the um, length of viability in and we couldn't get it figured out for the slides and for printing. So, but there's lots of charts online that talk about this. And actually this book has an insane amount of information on starting seeds, on seed saving, they've got charts for how long um, 
for how long you can save the seeds and and they go through different types of um, actually I'll go into that after um, but yeah so this book is pretty awesome for a lot of that kind of information but yes yeah, so seeds don't throw them out after one year Inside a paper bag. Inside a paper bag. Yep, and then then they'll keep longer then, right? Yeah. Yep. So she'll put them in a bag in a container in the freezer, and then they'll keep even longer yet, which is very true. They found seeds from a couple hundred years ago and germinated them, and they keep going. So it's pretty amazing. Yeah, I want to say the same thing. I was in farms in 1983. Pardon? Almost 40 years ago. Okay. Yeah, it is amazing. Yeah, yeah. So then I just say, don't quickly throw your seeds out. It is when I hear of people throwing them out because I didn't get them all planted last year. I'm like, please don't, because they do. They keep quite well. And then if you are unsure about your seeds, you can do a germination test, which is pretty simple. Just get a piece of paper towel, get it damp, stick it in a um, put put your seeds in that obviously. Stick it in a Ziploc bag and set it somewhere warm. And within 10 days, most things germinate within 10 days, you will have sprouts. And then if you put 10 seeds in there and you have five germinated, you have about a 50% germination rate on those seeds. So then you need to decide if it's worth planting them for that rate or not. Because um, I know a lot of people, when they, will, when they plant seeds in their pots, they'll throw two or three seeds in each pot um, and then they'll just pick the best one, but again, I don't do that. I only put one in each pot because I don't want to waste my seeds. I hate throwing plants out. And then I would, each time I would go, instead of pulling it out and throwing it out, I would plant it. And then I would end up with like 300 tomato plants. So if you are fine with, if you're better at me than throwing, th with throwing things out, then that is the recommended way. And then you pick your hardiest seedling in order to keep it. Okay, just um, wait, maybe, Jen, you better bring it over to Adam. Oh, <laughs> what a sign. Well, we need to try to mic things, <laughs> or I need to say everything, and I'll let Adam say his thing. No, I'm just going to, no. I was just going to say, uh, so the wheat, or the, our seed seeds that we're intending to grow keep a long time, so do wheat seeds. So it's coming back to Jennifer's uh, story about when you're planting your garden, how much time are you willing to put into it? Um, if you leave those weeds because you're tired of weeding, those weed seeds, there are certain weeds in the agriculture industry that can stay dormant and, and germinate 70 years later. Um, so so to, let a, to let a weed just go and think, oh, okay, I'll get it next year, uh, just think of that twice. <laughs> Um, so yes, we went over how to germination test them, and then the other thing with germination testing is if you get like, if you do something like tomatoes and peppers and do the germination test, those seeds, if you're careful with them, you can plant them, and then at least you, every pot will end up with a seed coming up. So some people will germinate their seeds in paper towels and then plant, put them into soil, just so that you have one, one in each pot. Um, next, how to start plants and take care of seedlings. So, first off, there's where I want to talk about seed scarification. So some, seed some seeds have such hard seed coats that they even sometimes have a hard time bursting through or that they take a long time. So something like okra and then even nasturtiums. I find nasturtiums germinate on their own out in the garden where I don't want them to, so I think that they germinate pretty easily, but okra is one of those ones. They've got a pretty big seed, and then they benefit from scarifying. So that's like if you if you take a um, pair of nail clippers and clip a little piece off of the seed coat, or that you break them, or that you rub them on sandpaper. It just helps the germination process to go faster, because otherwise okra can take weeks in order to germinate. But there's not a lot of 
um, vegetable seeds that need that, whereas there's definitely more plant, more flower seeds. I just don't know flowers well, so can't tell much about that. But yeah, so that's called scarifying them. Um, so when you are starting your plants, make sure you label everything. And I even suggest labeling every plant in the pot because eventually these ones are going to be transplanted into a bigger pot and then you're one label on four pots and then you're gonna think that you're gonna keep them all separate. It doesn't really happen. So just make labels for everything. You can buy little tea labels at the dollar store. So they're $1.25 for 10 last year. But then also we pick up um, the vertical blinds on the side of the road on garbage day. And then you can break these all up and then you have got a bunch of seed labels and then you can just throw them out, otherwise they would have ended up in the dump eventually anyways. And you can also um, rub it off, but in general, we find enough vertical blinds on the side of the road that I don't even worry about it. And then these do not rot, you don't get any mold growing on them. Whereas if you use um, popsicle sticks, you get mold growing on them and then that can spread into the pot around it too. So I recommend using plastic or if you want to write with tags on each pot, it's just not as easy to see when you're working on it. Um, so that is onto labels. And then planting depth. Um, in general, it is twice the size of the seed. So if you have little carrot seeds, you just pretty much sprinkle them on top of the soil and sprinkle a little bit of dirt on top of them. But if you have something like beet seeds, they're a little bit bigger, so then you plant them deeper. And then something like beans, we plant about an inch deep. We plant the beans about an inch deep. So about twice the depth of the size of the seed for planting depth. Um, and then inside, keep them covered by a dome while they are germinating on the heat mat. But then once they are germinated, take off the dome, get rid of the heat mat because you don't actually need the extra heat um, once they're growing, not for most plants. And again, I grow in 15 degrees. We used to grow in about 10 or 12 degrees and start, um, let, the, let the plants grow in that because again, then they're a lot tougher than if you plant them upstairs in your 25 degree house. Yes? take the top off because if you wait for the last of them then you could end up getting problems but at that point already so like more than 50%? yeah well you can kind of guesstimate if you think that that you have really good seeds then you can leave it on till till 50% but if, it, if it's been on for like three days and you're still waiting or four days and you're still waiting for the rest of them to germinate I would take the cover off because you're better having less germinated and have them survive than get a fungal infection in your plants and you lose everything that you do have. So, um, and then another thing that if you, if you do start to get a little bit of whiteness on top of the soil, people will sprinkle cinnamon on the soil because um, a lot of the fungal spores don't like cinnamon. So if you sprinkle a bit of cinnamon on top of the soil, it helps to, to slow or stop the movement of fungus on your soil. Uh, make sure you water them lightly or from underneath and make sure you let them dry out. And make sure all pots can access water. I have an old grow set up. Did you, that one? Uh, one of, where's the other picture, Christy? Do you mind sticking it up? So these brown trays, they are really wonderful, but because they're old, they have sagged down. So the one year I had my plants on there and I thought that they were doing well and I was watering them, but only the middle ones were getting water because it was puddling in the middle. So then make sure that, that you figure out another way. So by then my tomato plants were big enough that I just was watering them all from the top so that they at least get a little bit of water. So, and then these are, this is store-bought grow set, set up and then we just replace the lights as we need it. But there was also the other picture of mine and that is just taking any kind of shelf and that is putting on shop lights and whatever, even um, your fluorescent lights.
out. Like I tell people, if you have fluorescent lights somewhere in the basement and you can somehow get your plants up to it, like you can even use those if you just change the bulbs, put adequate bulbs in them. And you don't actually need to have the grill lights or to have special anything because most of these in the second from the bottom, there's two little lights. Those are grill lights and then my ones from Canadian Tire, but the other three are all just fluorescents or shop lights that we use. Um, so, and then we talked a little bit about why seedlings die and dampening off is by far the most common reason. But then again, in this book, it's got different um, problems for why your seedlings are like leggy and spindly, or not enough light, or you're watering too much. It goes through all of that. So this book, again, it's got an awesome set of information for when you're starting plants and the problems that you're dealing with. They even go into talking about why your leaves are turning white or colored, or why um, they, they talk a little bit about the different deficiencies and what the plants look like for if they're phosphorus deficient or nitrogen deficient, because you do start to see that a little bit inside. And for that, I will often water with fish fertilizer because fish fertilizer, you can't over fertilize with fish fertilizer. It's one that it'll just wash out the extra that it doesn't need. So then once your plants start growing, then, then fish fertilizer is super beneficial. And then it's, you just buy it in like a liter jug or you can get really big ones and then you just water it down. And there are some that supposedly don't smell, they kind of smell. So they do smell a little bit fishy, even if they say they don't, or I've never found one that doesn't. Yeah. How about lake water then? Part of your creek, you can get some water from there. Yeah, probably be fine. Fish probably poo in there too. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, yes, yeah, so that book goes through different reasons why seedlings die. I just really wanted to hit on the dampening off, so now you guys have all heard that is like the biggest problem. Yeah. Dampening off is, is a fungal infection that attacks them like when the plants have been wet for too long then the, then the fungus starts attacking the base of the plant and you will actually see like it's like the plant like just all falls over like you had a beautiful plant and then it starts dying and it, they do die pretty quickly with dampening off and then that's what Courtney was saying that when you get dampening off in a lot of your pots that that's when you want to bleach them so that it doesn't pass on to the next year. Pardon? Uh, you can try drying them out, but a lot of times by that, by the time dampening off hits the plants, they're kind of done for. So, yeah. Um, and then when to start seeds. So you've got the zone with our different grow zones again. Do you want to throw that out? Throw that up for one thing. Because, so then again, this was our different zones for growing. We're 6B, and then there's a bunch of, um, there's, was it in our packages? Yes, on the back side of your package, again, they have got the start dates of a lot of things. And then they, like, the, the dots is where you start. So then inside you would start artichokes and onions in, well, onions are January. And then they just, it kind of, I'm not going to go through all of it. It kind of lays it out really nicely and succinctly so that you can find information on when to start different plants. And I have started things earlier, but then you have to keep them alive a lot longer. So I've got, um, I've got a greenhouse. So if I'm going to plant things out into the greenhouse, I'll start them inside earlier than this because I have somewhere bigger and different temperature for it to grow in. So uh, if you have greenhouses, then these dates get fudged a little bit, but hopefully we talk about greenhouses another time. So um, really in January, my biggest things are onions, leek, celery, and celerac. Those ones I often start because they are so slow growing. And onions, you start in a tray similar to this, or I do, because I grow a lot, and then it's got little holes in the bottom, and then it goes inside its watering tray, and you just fill the whole thing with dirt, 
Sprinkle onion seeds on the whole thing and just cover them up lightly and throw your cap on, but don't stick it on a heat on a heat mat if your heat mat gets too hot. So maybe then the towel in between for that would be beneficial. So onions is really one of the main things I start in here, like in without any small pots in, because onions are, they like to be beat up in order to grow well. So onions then while they're growing, once your tops get quite long and start flopping over, you just you give them a haircut, eat the tops as green onions, and you often cut their hair about two, three, sometimes even four times while they're inside. And then that actually hardens them up. It makes them a lot tougher. And then the other thing is you never transplant them inside. Like onions, they stay in the tray until you plant them outside. And then people get all afraid when they're planting their onions out because their, their roots get really tangled. But again, onions like to be beat up. You have to, like, if you don't, jostle onions roots, they are not nearly as tough and you will not get the onions that you are wanting. You've got to be hard on their roots and then you just, then um, once you get them all pulled apart, you plant them all out. So I think onions is probably one of the only ones that you want to be really, really hard on. And then um, something like celery and celerac, I will start in pots like this and I'll sprinkle like I don't know, 10, 15 seeds into each, and then that one, once they're a certain size, which we are talking transplanting at our next one, then, then you transplant them out. So, um, but again, you don't want to go through and put a single in each of these. Um, we do have these, this size of trays too we've used, and then you actually put one onion or one celery into each, I wouldn't use this for, or I mean not onion, celery or celerac, I wouldn't use this for onions still, this is still your best way for onions so that you are hard on the roots, but this works for celery and celerac, but I don't even plant that much. So, so there's different sizes, and then also, Christy brought these things, I don't know if anyone's heard of them, they are, oh my goodness, what's her Soil one? blockers. Soil blockers. And then you get, um, there's different mixes that you can make of different soils and put, and you really pack them hard in. And then you pop them out, and then they are this size of blocks. And then you can start your little tiny seeds, your celery, your celerac, into those ones. And then once they need to be potted up, then you use the big blocker to make another set of soil, and they have a perfect size hole for that cube to go into. And then it's pretty simple transplanting as long as you can get your soil to stick together is from what I've heard. But then you do not have pots, you don't have washing except for this thing. So then that is, I think it's a pretty neat idea. I've never gotten into that yet. So, um, so we're talking about starting, when to start seeds. Um, peppers is another one that some peppers I will, especially hot ones, I'll start in January because hot peppers take a long time to grow. So then I will often start those ones in January and then I start my tomatoes a lot of times in February but they generally don't recommend them to recommend starting them till March because they do get pretty massive before the May long weekend, the tomato plant. So then um, then the tomatoes, we generally would recommend that you start early to mid-March, and again, be ready to plant those up a lot of times. Tomatoes need the most potting up of any of them, especially if you try to grow tomatoes that are like massive for going outside. Um, I do not think that I, I don't know, anybody have questions? I'm not sure I, what I missed, so yeah. So she's asking if we've ever grown anything off of table scraps. So yes, things like celery, even if you buy like the Boston lettuce with the leaf, with the roots, even romaine lettuce, like uh, romaine and celery and green onions, you can stick them into a cup of water in the in the window and they'll grow. Pineapple tops. Pineapple tops, yeah, but pineapple tops take about two years to get a pineapple. Yeah, I let mine go. They, they would be good. I haven't survived those yet. I don't do good with plants in the house except for on my grow setup. So. Um, 
Um, oh, Adam's saying about rerooting tomato plants. And yeah, I will actually touch on that now for a sec. So um, in bigger greenhouses, they will try or they will start tomatoes to go outside. They would have an early set and then also a late set. And then you're starting them all in the 